Welcome everyone. Good day to all those who have joined us so far and we still have uh, more people joining us. I'm really excited to welcome you to today's March 2022 Food Thinkers. Our 2020 to 2022 Food Thinkers series seminar series brings together big ideas from women in academia, policy, business and advocacy on redesigning food systems. And I'm very, very excited today to welcome Marian Nassel of New York University, who's going to be talking about Food Politics 2022 Advocates Unite. Before I introduce Marian, I'd like to start with some housekeeping. My name is uh, Professor Corinna Hawkes. I'm director of the Center for Food Policy, and I'll be hosting today's Food Thinkers. And it's a real pleasure to welcome you to this Food Thinkers. If you want to receive our monthly newsletter and event updates about these food thinkers, just sign up to our mailing list. You can, uh, make, you can click on the link in the sign up in the chat box. And um, I'd just like to, to make it clear that this webinar is being recorded and it will be made available online afterwards via our YouTube channel. What's going to happen today is that Marion's going to talk to, for 40 minutes or so, and then we're going to go to Q&A. And we do always allow a lot of time for Q&A. So do bring, start your questions coming in uh, as, soon as, you, as soon as they come to mind. Put them in the Q&A box, though, not in the chat. And I will moderate those questions uh, after, after Marion's talk. We always try to get to all of the questions, but sometimes it's just not possible given the quantity that we get. Most of all, we want you to listen. We want you to engage. If you would like to tweet though, please do so. And our hashtag is food thinkers and our handle is at food policy city. So let me introduce uh, Marion. It's um, uh, Marion is, a, is a, someone I've known, um, particularly a pleasure to welcome her today. I've, I've known her think, since I think 2000, it's been over 20 years now uh, when we met when I was living in New York City and teaching uh, with her at uh, New York University. Marion kindly invited me to teach one of her classes when she was writing um, her, uh, her wonderful and incredibly important book, Food Politics, How the Food Industry Influences Nutrition and Health, which was published in 2020, um, sorry, 2002. And that's one of her many books, 14 books, uh, many of them prize-winning books, including Food Politics, uh, Safe Food, What to Eat, and Savory Truth. And her most recent book is Let's Ask Marion What You Need to Know About the Politics of Food, Nutrition and Health, which was published in 2020. And her forthcoming book uh, with the University of California Press is a memoir to be published this year. So Marion is Paulette Goddard Professor of Nutrition, Food Studies and Public Health Emeritus at Emerata, sorry, at New York University and Visiting Professor of Nutritional Sciences at Cornell University. She's got honorary degrees uh, from several universities and was trained uh, originally in molecular biology, where she earned her PhD um, and uh, MPH in public health nutrition from the University of California, Berkeley. And as all of those who've joined will know, her research and writing examines the scientific and socioeconomic influences on food choices and its consequences, emphasizing the role of the food industry. Marion is a trailblazer. Uh, she is someone who's inspired many of us and um, she has uh, showed incredible tenacity and boldness in her writing and in her work. And given that her memoir is coming out in 2022, when we were discussing what we'd like her to talk about today, I said, please come and talk about yourself. You inspire many of us. Uh, I know it's not what you normally do, but please come and tell us a bit about yourself and, uh, and share that with us uh, in the context of your memoir coming out. So that's what we're going to have today. So I'll pass over to, to Marion with no further ado. Over to you. 
Oh, thank you, Corinna, um, and thanks for inviting me. And uh, this is going to be an experimental talk. I'm much, much more comfortable talking about my work and my interests in food politics than I am about talking about myself. Um, but I guess I'd better get used to it. So thank you for being part of the guinea pigs who are going to get the first memoir talk um, on this. Um, so as you can see from this slide, which I hope you can see. Can somebody get back to me and tell me that you're seeing the slides all right? Yep, they're good. Thanks, Marian. Great, thanks. Um, um, I write books about food politics. I've written a lot of books about food politics, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But what I want to talk to today and what stimulated the idea of writing a memoir is the questions that I get asked all the time. Um, when I started out teaching nutrition, I got asked all the time, what should I eat? I have a book called What to Eat that, is, that addresses those questions. Um, and people really care about their personal diets. I totally get that, but I'm interested in the politics of food. Um, and the, the other questions that come up more recently and especially in recent years are people who look at my career and say, what should I do? How did you do it? How did you get there? How do you handle it? And how do I do what you do? Um, and I get asked those questions all the time. Um, when they first started coming up, the personal questions, they really surprised me. Um, I thought, really, I'm here to talk about the issues, not about myself. But the questions persisted. And in 2019, I got asked by the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition to write a um, biography for a series that they have on people in nutrition who've uh, you know, have had careers in nutrition. And at the time that I wrote mine, they were all white men. Um, and I read their, I read their biographies and they were all about how famous and important they were and all the fabulous things that they had done. And I thought, oh, I really can't do that. I really can't. Um, but I did manage to put together uh, somewhat of a biography in which I described myself as a woman of the 1950s, which I think really colored everything that happened afterwards. And that gave me the idea that um, maybe these questions that everybody uh, was asking me could be answered or somehow in my mind, I was able to pull this off and write this piece. Um, and uh, although I never heard anything about it, I don't know if anybody ever read it. Um, and then came the pandemic. And I don't think you can give a talk these days without recognizing what the pandemic has done. Um, in February 2021, I made this slide about the 500,000 COVID related deaths in the United States. Um, it's a year later and those deaths have practically doubled and will within the next few days. Um, we're having a couple of thousand, one or 2,000 deaths in the United States every day. Um, so that's the context in which this takes place. And on March 13th, 2020, when it was clear the pandemic was getting really serious, I moved out of New York City and I moved upstate to the Finger Lakes, to the southern end of Lake Cayuga, um, to live full time with my partner who has a house in Ithaca. We have a house in Ithaca. Um, and usually I commute, but I kind of moved up there full time. Um, it's not a terrible place to be. It's country, but it's beautiful. Ithaca is famous for its gorges and waterfall. And we have a house on the lake, uh, which means I can get out in my kayak every day that it's warm enough to do that. Um, and I do that every day that I can. Um, but I had plenty of time to contemplate my life while I was up there in the pandemic. And I thought that a memoir was a reasonable project. I wrote a memoir, um, University of California Press is going to publish it. It's coming out in October, 2022. Yesterday, it went up on Amazon, which means it can be pre-ordered uh, from there or anywhere else. That's my commercial, it's the last I'll say about that. Um, but writing it was an interesting experience. Um, 
I got to think about how I got where I am and um, answer the questions that I get asked all the time, and then try to think about what relevance it could possibly have to anybody else. Um, that's me 50 years ago, by the way, um, when I was at Brandeis University. Uh, the, um, it never occurred to me when I was growing up or even in the early stages of my career that I would be considered the powerful foodie uh, taking on the soda giants or my all time favorite, one of the country's most hysterical anti food fanatics. Um, I, would, I still laugh every time I see that it's still up on the web. Um, you know, I love food and the idea of being called anti-food cuts me to the quick. Um, but I'll give you a quick biography. Um, I was a depression era baby born in the 1930s. I came from a very, very poor family and a family with very low expectations um, for what I would do or what anybody would do. I grew up in the 19, I came of age in the 1950s. I was the first in my family to go to college. Everybody I knew was getting married. I got married too at the age of 19. Um, I dropped out of college for a while. I went back to college, eventually graduated. I worked as a lab technician for a couple of years. Um, at the time, the only jobs that were available for women were secretaries, teachers, or in my case, lab technician. I had two children, pretty young. Um, and then eventually, out of the misery of staying home with children, I was strongly encouraged to go to graduate school. I went to graduate school and finished. Uh, but this was a time of very, very low expectations for women and very few options for women. And I consider myself as um, uniquely fortunate in having come of age in an era when doors were opening to women, the women's movement was starting, uh, there were, it was a time of great social ferment and opening up of society, and doors were open to me that would not have been open 10 years earlier, uh, for example, so that in that sense I was very, very fortunate. I was also very fortunate in growing up at a time when someone from a poor family like mine could go to college at extremely low cost, could live in reasonable housing at extremely low cost, um, and could, and you know, had health care and other kinds of, you know, had a great education that I never had to pay for. Things that are absolutely impossible for young people in the United States today to even contemplate. Um, so uh, this biography from an article that was once in a paper, um, I went to Berkeley, I lingered in Berkeley for a long time, I got my doctorate in molecular biology in 1968, uh, my first job was at Brandeis University outside of Boston, I was given a nutrition class to teach and fell in love with it. Um, I then got married again, moved to San Francisco and taught at the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine for a while, and then went to Washington to uh, essentially edit the Surgeon General's report on nutrition and health. I was there for a couple of years. Um, when I was in at the University of California, San Francisco, I wrote a book on nutrition for medical students. Those were the really early things that I did. And then in 1988, I moved to New York to chair a department of home economics, uh, kind of an amazing thing for someone with a degree in molecular biology to do, but that's what I did. did. It was the only job I got. I looked for a lot of jobs. That was the only one I got. Um, and then was fortunate enough in 1996 to have an enormous stroke of luck. And my department invented the field of food studies. Um, which then became, which then framed my career for the next number of years. Food politics came out in 2002 and it changed everything. It really did. Um, so, but it took a long time. One of the reasons that the memoir is called Slow Cooked is it took me a very, very long time to do this. I was in my mid sixties when food politics came out. But let's go back a little while. Um, I've always loved food. I was always interested in food, but there was really no opportunity to study it, except um, in a, to study agriculture or dietetics. I was a city girl, agriculture 
didn't make any sense to me at the time. And I didn't really understand the importance of agriculture and food systems until much, much later. Um, and I didn't last in dietetics very long. Um, at Brandeis, I was handed a nutrition class to teach. It was like falling in love and I've never looked back. I used Francis Moore Lappe's Diet for Small Planet in my first class, which my first nutrition class, which brought agriculture and nutrition together. And I used a book called Food for People, Not for Profit that was published by the Center for Science and the Public Interest um, in the early 1970s, also in that first class, because it brought agriculture and food consumption together and also dealt with the social values of food, the health effects, the costs, effective policy. It just brought history, social science, politics together in a way that totally made sense to me then and still makes sense. I taught my first nutrition class in 1976, a long time ago. Um, since 1988, I've been at NYU. That also changed everything. Um, I was appointed at NYU as a full professor with tenure. It was a miracle at the time. I look back on it, I still consider it a miracle um, because I went from being a fired lecturer at the University of California to a full professor with tenure two, two years later. Uh, an enormous stroke of good luck. I think a lot of it having to do with the fact that NYU is desperate to get a chair for its home economics department and I was willing to take that job. I'm the Paulette Goddard Professor of Nutrition Food Studies and Public Health at NYU Emerita. At the time I've been Emerita since uh, 2017. And I just want to say something about who Paulette Goddard was because I love being the Paulette Goddard professor. She was a 1940s movie star, um, married to Charlie Chaplin and several other people. Um, she played in his uh, film Modern Times and others. And then later she married Eric Murray Remark, who wrote All Quiet on the Western Front. Um, and he and moved in very, very fancy intellectual New York circles. And when she died, she had no children. She left $20 million to NYU for scholarships and faculty development. And I was lucky enough to get one of her fellowships, but I really enjoy that. It's as close as I'm ever going to get to being a movie star. Um, at NYU, I wrote books. Uh, it took me a while to figure out how to do that, but once I figured out that books were uh, not only interesting and useful, but also fun, I like writing them, I produced a lot of books. And this is the output since 2002. Like any other academic, um, I do research, teach, and public service. The research is the books and articles that I've written. Um, and then I've also taught and I do a lot of what goes under the heading of public service at NYU. So I'll say something first about, whoops, about the articles. Um, I've always written articles and uh, in the past published them in not very important places, but the venues have gotten better. Most recently, I write, I've written articles about corporate funding of nutrition research and practice, which I'm very concerned about. I had something in the American Journal of Public Health last year about the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, its history and politics. And my most recent article co-written is with my, with my portion size, former doctoral student was on portions, what's happening with portion sizes in the United States. So I'm still doing some of that. I've got another article coming out in the American Journal of Public Health in June. Um, I also do interviews, and this was one on big food and big agriculture on the conflicted conflicts of interest in the university, something that I've been concerned about for a really long time. Um, and I teach. I teach courses on food policy and politics where I discuss food movements, the farm bill, food ethics, food systems, food sociology, food advocacy, food and whatever. Um, I've taught a lot of different kinds of classes. Um, and I taught up through last year. I'm not teaching this year. And I don't know what will happen next year. Um, one of my most recent courses was in the fall of 2020. 
Um, it was a big ideas course series on food politics in the coronavirus era. Um, and it was the first time I had taught asynchronously. I prepared a bunch of videos and the students watched them from all over the world. And um, it was a very strange way to teach. It's the first time I've ever taught not having any contact whatsoever with students. Um, and I'm not sure I liked it very much, but um, those videos exist. And I do public service. And under the heading of public service is lectures like these. Um, I've written newspaper columns. I do lots and lots of question and answer things, media interviews. I write an almost daily blog at foodpolitics.com. This is from a week or so ago. Um, and uh, I post five times a week, once a day, five, five, five times a week. Um, I've got a Twitter account at Marion Nessel, and I've just opened up an Instagram account also at Marion Nessel, but I haven't used it yet because I don't know how. I'm waiting for someone to explain to me how to, how to do it, um, but that will be coming. Um, I write newspaper articles, sometimes journalism. Um, I wrote an article about the farm bill that um, got a lot of attention because nobody understands the farm bill and in it I confessed about how I taught a class in which I didn't understand it and sometimes write about current events. Um, <clears throat> this was when the Pepsi-Cola sign in New York was going to be torn down and everybody was really upset about it and I thought it was really okay if it got torn down. <laughs> Um, but how I started writing about food politics, I can assign that to a particular uh, epiphany. And that epiphany occurred in the early 1990s when I went to a meeting at the National Institutes of Health at the National Cancer Institute. And it was a meeting on behavioral causes of cancer, um, smoking and diet. I was one of two speakers on diet. The other was Jane Brody, columnist, uh, for the New York Times for about 50 years. She just ended that column. Um, but there we were at a meeting of mainly anti-smoking physicians and scientists who were giving talks on uh, what to do to try to get people to stop smoking. And I knew that the cigarette industry marketed I knew that the cigarette industry marketed to children. I had seen the Joe Camel, Camel ads, but I had never, never paid any attention to them. They were just part of the landscape. I didn't go around looking at stores near schools to see how many cigarette ads they had in them. But at this meeting, a, a cancer researcher named John Pierce from the University of California, San Diego, <clears throat> gave a talk on tobacco marketing to children in which he showed slide after slide after slide of cigarette marketing to children everywhere, not only in the United States, but also abroad, um, in the jungles of Africa, in the high Himalayas, any place that you could think of, there were cigarette ads. And this was a revelation to me. I mean, I knew it was happening, but I had never paid any attention to it. And I walked out of that talk saying to Jane Brody, we should be doing this for Coca-Cola. And so I started doing that for Coca-Cola. Whenever I traveled, I started taking pictures of Coca-Cola advertising that I had never noticed before. I started paying attention. So this was the Lisbon airport. Uh, this was a market in Cyprus. Every pl place I went, there were food ads everywhere. <clears throat> just part of the normal landscape. And I started writing about those things. I started writing articles about them, uh, about how the food industry was marketing um, in ways that people didn't even notice, particularly marketing to children, uh, pouring rights contracts in schools where these soda companies would come into the schools and uh, in return for what seemed like a lot of money, have exclusive right to sell their products to grammar school children or junior high school children and so forth. And so I started accumulating articles. I did that all through the 1990s. And then at the end of the 1990s, I had a sabbatical coming up. And by that time I had figured out uh, that 
NYU valued books, that food studies, which we now had in our department, was a humanities program that valued books, and that I could do a book, and that I could take the articles that I had written and put them together. Um, into a book. And that was the genesis of food politics, which came out in 2002 and has gone into two subsequent editions in 2007 and 2013. And food politics changed everything for me. It really did. It, um, I had three goals for writing it. I will confess. Um, one of my goals was that I wanted the Dietetic Association to stop printing industry funded fact sheets in its publication, uh, the journal, what was then the Journal of the American Dietetics Association, where they would have straight facts about beverage choices sponsored by the American Beverage Association that concluded all beverages can have a place in a well-balanced eating pattern, just what you would expect. I wanted them to stop doing it. I thought it gave nutrition a very bad name. I wanted recognition that food industry marketing had something to do with obesity for children and adults, particularly children. I never wanted to go to another conference on childhood obesity and have people fretting about what we're going to do about getting mothers to feed their children better. Let's blame obesity on mothers. Um, and that was what the conferences were like. I would go to one after another after another. And all I heard about is how are we going to educate mothers to feed their children better? Nobody was talking about food industry marketing as if it didn't exist or it wasn't noticed. Of course, it's not supposed to be noticed. If it's being done well, you don't notice it just as I hadn't noticed it. And then I had a personal goal. I wanted better speaking invitations. <laughs> Um, and that goes under the heading of you have to be careful what you ask for, because I got them um, many, many, many more than I could handle. Um, so that changed everything. And I really, I it never occurred to me that uh, the book would have the kind of influence that it had. I still can't assess its influence. Other people have to do that. Um, but it's still out there and it still sells occasionally. So that kind of brings me to where I am today. Um, and what I'm interested in right now is global food system problems. Uh, and there are three really, really big ones with a fourth that just got thrown into the works. And that's hunger and food insecurity, which affect billions of people in the world. Um, obesity and the non-communicable diseases for which it's a risk factor, which affect billions of people in the world. The environmental effects of food pr production and consumption, which affect everybody, all of them due to dysfunctional food systems. And now we have added to that the effects of COVID-19, which are intimately related to all of the others. Um, to deal with. And as people who are interested in public health and food systems, these are the problems we have to grapple with. Um, and from my perspective, the root causes of all of these problems are food systems that maximize um, profit. I was really really basically that simple. I'm certainly not the only person who is saying these kinds of things. Um, and as I like to put it, food companies can't be expected to be public health or social service agencies. They're not. They're businesses. And like any other business, their job is to maximize profits. And once you understand that, and once you see that really food companies, that's their job. Um, that's what they're supposed to do is to keep their stockholder happy, happy and to make profits, to grow their profits every 90 days as they're expected to do by Wall Street. Um, then you understand a lot about what's going on in the food system and you also understand what you're up against. And I thought this was uh, the, uh, under the heading of up against that this was um, on one slide, an example of what the COVID pandemic was doing in the United States uh, from the chef, Jose Andres, who's become a international hero for his work in feeding people in desperate circumstances. Um, he posted this tweet 
in which he showed how food was being destroyed at the same time that people were lined up in automobiles for food handouts at food banks um, in the at the start of the pandemic. And you look at that and you think, this is our economy in action. This is our, these are food systems in action and everything that's wrong with food systems. I thought that was, um, you know, one picture worth a thousand words. Um, and I'm very hopeful these days that things are going to get better uh, because of two concepts that are very, very recent that have to deal with food systems. The first of them is ultra processed foods, which is a term that's only been around since 2009. And the second is the triple duty actions um, that came from the two Lancet reports that came out in 2019, the Eat Lancet report and the Global Syndemic report, which talked about the need to address food system problems through triple duty actions that addressed obesity and non-communicable diseases under nutrition and climate change at the same time. Um, and I think these have changed the game for talking about nutrition and public health and for talking about food systems in general because they send a clear roadmap for what needs to be done. So I know you know about all this, but let me just say a few things about ultra processed foods. They are adored by 21st century capitalism because they're highly profitable. Whether they're addictive or not, we can argue about, um, but people certainly love to eat them and love to eat them in very large quantities. You can't eat just one. Um, the definition of them was extremely important because it set out um, a roadmap, not only for action, but also for research. And this is my take home lesson on the definition of ultra processed foods, that they have a lot of additives and unfamiliar ingredients. They're industrially produced. You can't make them in your home kitchen, which seems to me to be the bottom line on this. Um, they have a lot of other things in them that have calories. And they, uh, the fact that they were able to be defined means that research was then possible on their effect on health. And in 2020, there were six major comprehensive systematic reviews demonstrating that ultra processed foods are associated with higher risk for obesity, type two diabetes, heart disease, mortality, the whole works. Um, there are now eight or 900 studies that Carlos Montero has collected um, that, uh, that demonstrate this association. And then of course, there was one clinical trial that I think is the most important nutrition study done in decades. And this was done at the National Institutes of Health in which people were put on either a diet of ultra processed foods or a comparable diet where the foods were not processed but comparable in calories, sugar, salt, fat, fiber, and everything else. And what this study found to the enormous surprise of the investigators and everybody else was that people on the ultra processed food diet ate 500 calories a day more than they did when they were on the other diet. 500 calories is an enormous difference. And they, lost, they gained or lost a pound a week, depending on which of those diets they were on. Very, very important. It tells us that ultra processed foods encourage people to eat more. The first thing you do if you want to change the food system is to get people to eat less of ultra processed foods. So that brings me to the triple duty actions. Uh, that is fixing climate change, fixing obesity and starvation, all three at the same time. Um, and I think the Global Syndemic Report um, was one of the most important <laughs> nutrition reports ever done. Um, it didn't get very much publicity because it came out the week after the Eat Lancet Report, which got tons of publicity. And, and that's too bad because it's really well worth reading for its analytical ability. Its analysis was really profound. And it, it said the syndemic, the three syndem, the three epidemics syndemic were due to the market failure, attributed to market failure. Um, the cause of all three is food industry fiduciary responsibility that is profits over everything else. 
Most of the profits come from ultra processed foods. That's a big problem. Um, it's a failure in self-regulation of the industry. And it demonstrates that partnerships with industry pose very, very grave risks. It analyzed the, econ the economic system as being consumpt consumptogenic. I guess that's a euphemism for capitalistic, but okay, let's use consumptogenic. These systems prioritize corporate economic power over everything else. They promote privatization of sometimes what used to be public goods. They externalize the costs of this system and they neglect the risks of this system. Um, they analyzed, the report analyzed policy inertia that you just can't get policy to budge. And that's because governments are weak. Opposition to policy by food companies is enormous. And there's no really strong civil demand for doing anything about this. And so that raises the question, what do you do about it? And I think what you do is you follow their idea as a, for a roadmap for uh, regulating the food industry, for example. This was the first time I had ever seen this in print. And they had a great big long list of suggestions, stopping subsidies and tax breaks, requiring companies to pay external costs, stopping them from opposing public health measures, keeping them out of public policy, setting guidelines for, for revealing conflicts of interest, strengthening freedom of information laws, that's a United States issue, but an important one, um, requiring declarations of political donations, also a United States issue, strengthening corporate accountability, um, and, and in general, doing all of these things at once to keep the food industry out of public policy. And the, the report went on to say, I called for a transformative social movement uh, to do some of these things. And so my question is, how do we get the social movement? That's what I'm really interested in. Fortunately, there are guidebooks. There's Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals, which tells you how you go about doing community organizing. And then the best book I've ever seen on how to do this kind of organizing is this book, Organizing for Social Change, um, which comes out of Midwest Academy. I, it's just an extraordinary volume that gives you step-by-step -step how you go about doing organizing that's likely to be uh, or advocacy that's likely to be effective. So if we think of advocacy as a public policy uh, process to change society and its goals as improving the food system, meaning ending hunger, promoting nutritional health and protecting the environment, um, how do you go about doing that? Well, in theory, you identify the problem you want to solve, you do research to make sure you understand it well, you identify specific goals, who the target is that you're trying to get to, who can help you change things, you form alliances and recruit allies, uh, you communicate and educate, you act, you do something, and then you evaluate how it worked, and if it didn't work, you persist. That's the theory. Um, and this book, Bite Back, which came out a couple of years ago, and which, for which I wrote the foreword, um, has it a, a, a quick appendix that tells you how to go about doing that and how to set goals, identify resources, organize your allies, identify targets, and develop tactics. And to the extent that these are followed, they work. Um, Beautiful Trouble is another uh, roadmap for how you do advocacy. And it does something that I had never seen before and I thought was really interesting. It distinguishes uh, concrete from communicative advocacy. Concrete advocacy is you set a specific goal that has a measurable outcome and you measure the outcome. But then it also talks about communicative advocacy in which you build a base you recruit allies, and you influence public opinion. I think you need both kinds, and both kinds are doable. So I'm often asked, 
What makes me hopeful about any of this in the face of enormous corporate opposition? And I think there's plenty of evidence that since 1990, for example, lots of good things have happened in the food system. It's just that if you're not old enough, you don't realize how much things have changed. There's better food everywhere, at least in the United States. We have more farmers markets, more community supported agriculture, more organic food. Um, there's an increased focus on ultra processed food. The word is out on ultra processed foods. There are more urban farms, more young farmers, more city composting. Um, we have much better food, school food now than we did 20 or 30 years ago. There are more cities in the United States with $15 min dollar minimum wages, more cities with soda taxes, more countries with warning labels more food studies programs. That's my, that's my favorite. When we started food studies at NYU in 1996, we were it. Now there's 50 or 60 such programs throughout the world. And then you, the fact that you're interested in these kinds of issues, that you're taking programs um, that are teaching you about food policy, that you care about food systems, seems to me to be plenty of reason for hope. But I think there are other reasons as well even though the opposition is really fierce, um, it's possible to overcome it. And I was very interested in this book by Robert Frank, who's an economist at Cornell, who writes about climate change. And his conclusion from everything that he's seen is that the environmental actions of seemingly, um, seemingly small actions have an enormous impact, much, much greater than anybody predicts. And his classic example of that is solar panels on roofs. If somebody in a neighborhood puts solar panels on, everybody else in the neighborhood is going to follow soon after that. So that means that if you take action, um, the people around you are going to notice and it may make other people also be willing to take action and to think about the larger scale policies that are really needed for progress. Another is on this paper on knowingly setting unrealistic goals in public health. Um, public health people talk about unrealistic goals all the time. I've just talked about unrealistic goals, um, but this particular analysis of unrealistic goals points out that they motivate action, they attract resources, they promote coordination, evaluation, and accountability, they give people an agenda for what to do, and they expand expectations. They have educational value, and sometimes, just sometimes, if you're really lucky, they can be achieved. Um, I think gay marriage in the United States is probably the best example of that, uh, where nobody ever thought that could happen, and then suddenly it did. So things can happen if you're ready and if you're prepared for them, and if you're willing to keep your eye on what you really want. So I'm all for participation in food democracy. I want everybody to get involved in advocacy. Um, if you don't do it, who will? And if you don't do it now, when will you do it? So I think that working on transformation of the global food system is a really useful thing to do, even if it seems frustrating at times. And even if you don't think you're making progress, you're really not in a position to evaluate that and you won't know until the movement is complete. So that's what I have to say, vote with your vote, even better vote, vote with your fork, but even better vote with your vote. Um, and I'm very, very pleased and honored to have had the opportunity to talk to you about this today. Thanks so much. Thank you, uh, Marion, that was uh, a real tour de force. Thank you very much indeed. And there's plenty of questions coming in. So I'll, I'll give you pause, but I will um, uh, take a look at these questions. And uh, lots of, of different ones coming in. L let me start with one uh, about uh, the, your view on the large food industry going into um, lower middle income countries, countries of the global south, and with their ultra processed foods, exploiting um, lack of legislation and so on, the need to, for job creation. Um, the question is, what is your view on this? 
Well, it's to, it's exporting our disease problems as well, and we've already seen that. That in countries where uh, multinational food co corporations have moved in with ultra processed foods, people, you know, what you have to understand about ultra processed foods is everybody loves them. They're formulated to make everybody love them. There isn't anybody who doesn't love them. Um, so the question is, how do you put them in proportion in a reasonable diet? Particularly once you understand that when you've got a bag of these things in front of you, you can't stop eating it. It's not like eating a salad. Everybody can stop eating salad. Nobody can stop eating cookies or chips um, or crisps or whatever you call them. The, um, they need to be stopped. And so the question is how to stop them. And that's why I think that what's happening in Latin America is so exciting, where in countries like Brazil and Chile and Peru and Mexico, um, advocacy groups have managed to get warning labels on food products. Um, they've managed to get restrictions on marketing to children. How well these things are being uh, implemented is debatable. And lots of people are writing about the enormous food industry opposition to them. But these are places where advocates have actually been successful in at least making some attempt to try to stop what's going on. And the campaigns educate the public about what the problem is. And we've seen in the United States that soft drink consumption, sugary, sugary beverage consumption is way down in the United States. The message got out through all of the soda tax campaigns, even though many of the soda tax campaigns lost, um, the, the educational value of having them, the uh, ability to demonstrate the hundreds of millions of dollars that the soda companies were willing to spend to defeat, to defeat these measures had educational value uh, that was really very helpful and sugar consumption is down and soda consumption is down. So it can happen. Indeed, thank you. And one of these policy approaches um, is uh, around the competition in the industry is antitrust legislation. And Anthony has a question for you. He asks what your thoughts are on the current US antitrust policies being led by Lena Khan. If you're familiar with those, are they going to be effective in the field of food and food politics? Well, it depends on whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. Um, I have my days. I mean, certainly the president of the United States has said that he wants to break up the meat uh, trust. Uh, the four meat companies own 85% of uh, all meat processing in the United States. And we saw the result of that during the pandemic when the companies forced the plants to stay open, even though thousands and thousands of workers were getting sick. Um, and working and were being forced to work even when they were sick. Um, and the companies wrote the presidents, that was President Trump, wrote President Trump's uh, executive order forcing the plants to stay open. So we saw the power of the meat industry there. Um, and we see that meat prices are going up very, very dramatically in the United States. And that's bad for politics. So the current president is trying to do something about that. Will he be able to? I don't know. I mean, we have a divided government and we have a divided population with very, very different views about these things. Um, how educated the views are of the opponents to these sorts of things we can argue about, but the, American public is deeply divided and it's hard to know how this will play out. A lot of it will depend on what happens in the next election. Thank you. On to a couple of questions around uh, industry again, but with conflicts of interest issues. Hilda's got a question on um, the fact that there's a strong emphasis in this country, I think she means the UK, on engaging with industry and seeing them as part of the solution. I think we see that in a lot mm -hmm. of countries around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, in Hilda's view, this is a clear conflict of interest that only benefits the industry, uh, which and then enables it to boast about corporate social responsibility. How can we combat this? Well, again, this is advocacy. And uh, if you wanna combat it, you have to educate and demonstrate 
that partnerships with industry carry grave risks. And there is certainly, I mean, that's again why I think that global syndemic report was so important. I wish it had been called something else that's not a very user-friendly title. Um, but the analysis in that report made it very clear that partnerships with industry carry great risks. They almost always end up helping industry more than they help anybody else. Uh, what we need is regulation of industry. We need very, very sharp boundaries be, uh, that set limits on what industry can do. And I thought the laundry list that I showed you was a pretty good place to start. Keep them out of public policy. Keep them off the table. Uh, you know, I, the argument that we will not, you know, that the industry feeds us and therefore we have to work with industry, uh, that doesn't work. I'm not against corporate profits. I think corporations have every right to make a profit and profits are just fine. It's the greed that bothers me, uh, the amount of profit. Why do they have to grow their profit every 90 days? Every company in the world cannot grow its profits every 90 days. That's just not possible. Growth cannot be infinite. We already have 4,000 calories available per person per day. For every single person in the United States, man, woman, little tiny baby, that's twice what the population needs. How much food can you sell under those circumstances? I mean, I would argue that one of the reasons why people gained weight so quickly in the 1980s was because food companies were doing everything possible to get people to eat more because their profits were at risk because the number of calories in the food supply had gone up so dramatically. Uh, so you need advocacy around those issues. You need organized advocacy. You need coalitions of advocacy groups. You need community work. And this is very, very difficult work. Nobody wants to do it. And the big problem is trying to figure out how to get paid for it. It's an enormous problem. How do you get paid for advocacy work? Lobbyists get paid very, very nice salaries to spend full time in Congress trying to get Congress to do what the corporations want. How do advocates get paid? To me, that's the single most important barrier to, um, to advocacy. So you have to figure out how to do it without money. That's pretty tricky. That is tricky. And it's a very good point you've just made about how you pay for advocacy. Stuart's made a similar point to, to Hilda here about um, obviously you're concerned about the infiltration of the ultra processed food industry into nutrition policy spaces and conferences and you've written a lot about that and you highlight that in your your blog on a on a regular basis uh the question is how how do we address from Stuart is how do we address what seems to be a growing neglect of serious conflicts of interest is that just a question for advocacy too or does that have some particular tools around it that are also needed well i'm not sure i consider it one of my great failures you know, I wrote a book called Unsavory Truth, um, how food companies skew the science of what we eat, that I hoped would get a lot of publicity, would get people interested in the issues, would embarrass scientists into trying to find other ways of funding their research. Um, and that was a miserable failure. It never got reviewed. Um, I was never asked to speak at a nutrition conference about it. Um, I mean, it really has gotten the full silent treatment. Uh, and now I'm, you know, I, what I do is every Monday I post on my blog an example of industry funded study of the week, each more hilarious than the next, always with results that can be predicted from the title or if you know who the funder is, you can predict what the results will be. Um, and it's not doing any good. It certainly doesn't seem to me to be doing any good. And I, I think the one I did this week was researchers at Harvard, you know, who are the last people in the world that you would think would need corporate funding to do their research. And yet there it is. And everyone seems to think it's fine. And the excuses that are given for it is we can't get money anywhere else. I don't believe that. Um, and the, the big excuse is Industry doesn't affect our research when there is so much evidence that that's not true and that the influence occurs subconsciously or unconsciously. 
I mean, there's really an enormous body of literature that demonstrates that, that people who take industry funding don't recognize it. And yet it comes out, it shows in either the way the research questions are framed or the, the way they're interpreted, um, usually not in the conduct of the studies. Those are usually done okay, but it's everything else. Yeah. So, so I don't know. I mean, I'm, I keep doing it. Every Monday I post one. I have no lack of examples. The examples come in every day. People send me examples. Some of them are hilarious. You just can't believe that people would do studies like this. Um, and some of them are pretty insidious. This week, I actually posted one that was an industry funded study that came out with negative results. It showed no benefit of the sponsor's product. That's so rare that I thought it was worth highlighting. That's really a rare result. But most of them, you can predict what the, you can predict the funder from the title. You know, my question is always when I read these things, cocoa flavanols, who paid for this? Why would anybody look at the effect of cocoa flavanols on heart disease risk? There's only one reason to do that. And that's if you're trying to sell M&Ms. Well, you do a service posting these studies, Marion. Um, we're taking on some uh, very difficult to answer questions here. So I'll continue with uh, Sergio's question. Uh, Sergio comes from Brazil, he says, uh, where he says it's very, very difficult to contest the power of industrial agriculture, what they call agribusiness. Uh, and um, it, it makes the point that he says, I'll read it out, developing countries from the south rely and depend on these primary foodstuffs in order to generate economic growth. Um, and, and create this kind of very extractive economies. And so fighting the power of this when the country is so reliant on these uh, primary agribusinesses agri for, um, for their income. Um, how, do you, how do you fight? How do you deal with this kind of problems with a global perspective? Maybe it's an advocacy answer uh, again, but what are your thoughts on, on that very difficult problem? Well, I don't know how else you do it except through advocacy. But, I mean, you're not going to have, corporations are not willingly going to give up um, profits. They're not willing to do that. Their job is to generate um, returns to stakeholders, stockholders, whoever owns the company. That's their job. So the question is, how do you put limits on that? How do you promote a kind of agriculture? I mean, we can't go on having industrial agriculture forever. Um, the earth isn't going to support it. Um, it's just not gonna happen. The climate change is happening. Uh, the destruction of the Brazilian rainforest is going to be bad for the entire earth, not just Brazil. Um, you know, if we want humanity to survive, if we want agriculture to survive, we have to find a more sustainable way to do that. And there are plenty of models of doing it. Again, it's a question of how much greed do you have to have? Um, and how do you do the advocacy? How do you convince people that this is wrong? How do you set up counter models? If we don't do that, the earth isn't going to survive and humanity isn't going to survive. And maybe nobody cares because we're not gonna be around anyway. Um, but don't we care about what the future is like for our children or our grandchildren? Um, I don't know how you appeal to this, except by, uh, by providing counter models. Uh, the, the focus on regenerative agriculture seems really important to me. Uh, the focus on sustainability seems really important. Uh, and if we don't have masses of people who get behind this, it's very difficult to talk about these things when we have a war in the Ukraine right now. Um, and yet, if we don't focus on the future, we're not going to have a future. So I think we have to. And I think that it's worth doing, even if it seems politically unrealistic, um, even if it seems like these are goals that are absolutely impossible to, to achieve. If we're not working for, towards those, then we're not, uh, then I, I think we're not spending our lives in ways that 
are useful. It's very important to spend lives in useful ways. It makes you feel good about getting up in the morning. And maybe it'll do some good. And if you don't do it, then what? If you don't do it, who will? Yeah. Uh, is, the question, is the question that I keep asking. And that's what keeps me going. And if I can encourage, I mean, it's a little late for me, but uh, if I can encourage other people to pick up where I left off, it seems to me that's something that's worth getting up for. I agree. That there's a there's a, a difficult trap that has to be fought on the big economic side and the profitability side, but there's also issues for consumers, for people who who eat. Um, and you mentioned before about ultra processed foods being very likable. People love them. Uh, they're they're easy. They're very palatable. And Donna's got a point here that adds on to that, which is simply about cost. Oh, yeah. How can we make these substantial changes and reduction of ultra processed foods? when they're often the cheaper option and when you are lower income consumer perhaps, and when they are cheaper and you need to consider making some tough choices as a, as a person who's making decisions about what to buy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I can only speak from the standpoint of the United States, but fruits and vegetables are expensive here. Um, and if you look at Department of Commerce data, from 1990 to the 1980 to the present, the cost of all food has gone up in the United States. Um, but the cost of fruits and vegetables has gone up much, much more than the average cost of food. And the cost of ultra processed foods has gone up much, much less than the average cost of foods. And uh, you can attribute that very easily to policies that subsidize the cost of basic food ingredients, and that do not subsidize fruits and vegetables, which are still considered very odd specialty crops by the Department of Agriculture in a category by themselves and get tokens in support as compared, you know, a few million in, uh, as compared to billions of dollars in support for corn, soybeans, and so forth. So these are policy choices. Uh, and policies are made by people, people can change those policies. How do you get policy to change? Again, you're back to advocacy. You're back to trying to decide what policy you want changed, trying to figure out how that policy could, can be changed, what you have to do to get it to change, who has to join with you, and doing the very, very hard work of doing advocacy by the book. When advocacy is done by the book, it works. And the best example I can think of is the soda tax in Berkeley, in which uh, the organizers of that tax were followers of Saul Alinsky. They knew how Saul Alinsky worked. They used Alinsky methods. And basically that involved going door to door in rich communities and poor communities in Berkeley and talking to people about why the soda tax would be good for them. And they were able to sell it in the poor community because they could talk to people about type two diabetes. And the soda tax in Berkeley won by a vote of 76%. That's astonishing. Most votes in the United States are 50.1 to 49.9. This won by 76% because they did it right. The people who did the organizing knew what they were doing, did it in exactly the right way. It's a very good example. Um, but it took a big community effort on something that seems quite small, but the evidence on the effectiveness of it has been quite good. And following on from that, there's a, a point um, from, from Katie here about how uh, the Ukraine situation, which you've already mentioned, the Ukraine conflict and, and war, uh, is one of the factors leading to inflationary pressure. I'm actually sitting in Kenya at the moment, uh, and I've been uh, around and about uh, today in the last few days hearing about how prices are going to go up here because of the, of the cost of fertilizer going up and other, other costs going up. So clearly around the world, there are these tremendous inflationary pressures on the price of food. Uh, and you mentioned about going door to door and getting the support of the of the lower income co communities, but with people really under this price pressure 
uh, right now, which we know politicians, people, the public don't appreciate um, at all, and, and 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 politicians therefore always want to try and do something about it. How? What is? What's the argument going to be about how we need to hold tight and hold firm on these food systems um, changes and regulations that we need in the face of this? I mean, in the UK, for example, we're already seeing pressure, as Katie points out, to delay the marketing restrictions, which are on the uh, which you want the books to do what what's the what's the argument we can use here well the argument is that poor people have to eat and that if you have poor people who are eating healthfully it's going to be less of a drain on the healthcare system aside from being better for them so but these are policy issues um, if people don't have enough money for food, you get make sure they have enough money for food. We saw this in the United States during the pandemic when uh, food insecurity rose dramatically. People were out of work. They didn't have jobs. They didn't have any money. And when the government gave them money, food insecurity went down. Duh. Um, you know, I mean, this is you don't have to be a genius to figure this out. These are policy issues. You know, does the government care about the population? If the government doesn't care about the population, then the population needs to make sure the government knows how unhappy they are. Um, and this is where the weakness of civil society comes in. Somehow we have bred out of civil society the idea of um, fighting for rights and insisting on rights. So that's, I think that's where the organizing has to go. That I you're not, I'm, you're I mean, not I, poor. Be, I'm sorry, you're, let me just say one more thing. You're not poor because you, you're bad or because you've had poor judgment. You're poor because of the way the system works. Absolutely, it's a systemic issue. I mean, it's interesting in the UK, there is a very strong uh, civil society in, in many ways. And yet still the latest budget statement that just came out today or yesterday uh, still didn't give a sufficient priority to the high levels of food insecurity which have emerged recently. So it really, these are, are tough battles, but it's, it's um, people are working hard on them. And as you said earlier, it takes time. But one of these other approaches, and this is a question from Mary, is rather than trying to educate people about how to resist unhealthy food, should we be educating the public about the way that the food industry behaves? Absolutely, absolutely. And that's what I try to do in the books that I write. You know, I mean, when I say things like, food companies are not social service or public health agencies, people are shocked. They never thought about it before, just as I had never thought about it before. Um, you know, I, once you point out that the purpose of a food company is to make money for stockholders, it's not to make sure that you have something delicious to eat. That's not what they're about. Um, they're about money for stockholders. People get it right away. It doesn't take a lot of education to show that. I mean, you can give people examples and you have to give people local examples. I'm sure there are plenty in Great Britain. I have no yeah. doubt. I'm, I'm privileged to, to um, uh, uh, chair the board of an organization here in the UK called Bite Back 2030, in which they're undertaking some of this um, process of engaging with youth and helping youth understand what's going on. And it's incredible to see the transformation that can happen mm -hmm. by exposing these, uh, these, these issues. Another industry is the uh, breast, uh, breast milk substitutes industry. And Lena's got a question here. Lena says she works for the World Health Organization um, and they've been given the mandate to develop guidance for country to restrict the digital marketing of breast milk substitutes. Yes. As you know, this the code on breast milk substitutes has been in place for, for a very, very long time and it's still an endless battle. What advice might you have for the, for the World Health Organization in their development of guidance to restrict digital marketing of breast milk substitutes? Well, they need to read all of Philip Baker's work. Um, he's a researcher in Australia who's been producing paper after paper after paper. I think they come out every other day um, on marketing of breast milk substitutes and code violations um, and all of the ways in which these formula companies are marketing their products and make sure that the uh, World Health Organization does what it needs to do 
to put some curbs on, um, or at least to educate the public about what's going on. Again, th this is a very old issue that goes back many, many, many years to the Nestle boycott of when was that the 1970s and 1980s, and that we're still having these same arguments and stay, same fight seems astonishing to me, but the infant formula problem is still the same. And as birth rates have gone down, the formula companies have less of a market. And so they're trying to do absolutely everything they can to expand their market. Remember the purpose of food companies is to sell product. And once you understand that and have that firmly in mind, everything they do makes perfect sense. Um, so the World Health Organization has done what it can. It, can, it has to continue to do everything it can to promote the code um, and to make sure that countries abide by it and that governments hold the formula companies to some kind of accountability. And if there aren't civil society groups that are doing this, it's not going to happen. Indeed. Let, let's shift gears a bit to some issues around uh, around meat and uh, and animals. Uh, Ruth has uh, makes the point that uh, many new vegan food products are ultra processed, mm -hmm. uh, and she says, "How do we differentiate between um, the 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 types of, of it, the, she said the two types of vegan foods, such as coconut yogurt or oat milk, etc." Uh, is it acceptable, more acceptable to eat them? They're ultra processed, but they're vegan, uh, or should just eating all ultra processed, even if they're vegan, be discouraged? Mm. Yeah, this is an interesting question for me. I mean, I have some food rules, <laughs> and one of my food rules is never eat anything artificial. So that takes all of the artificial meats and dairy products off the table for me. I'm just not interested in them. I don't think they taste very good. They're close, but you know, if you if you want to be a vegan, that's fine. Why do you need to eat meat? Why do you have to have substitutes? Um, I mean, I've been told why, and people have explained to me. My favorite explanation is that um, a, a vegan mother told me that she was just so happy that these products existed, so that she could now take her child to fast food places. Um, the, uh, I thought, okay, got it, but the. Um, you know, they're ultra processed. They are. Whether they're better for the environment, the companies are going to an enormous amount of uh, trouble funding research, funding their own research to demonstrate that these things have less of a greenhouse gas effect than do raising animals and whatever. I think it would be really great if everybody ate less meat. Um, I, I'm an omnivore myself. Uh, I don't think no meat is ecological, makes ecological sense. Um, but certainly everybody and the planet would be better off eating less meat. Um, but these products are here. There's an enormous amount of money in them. I don't think we know yet what the outcome is going to be, but I'm not personally interested in them um, other than you know, academically, I don't buy them. I've tasted them. Some are better than others. Um, but, you know, I'm not, if I want to eat vegan, I just eat vegetables or, or whatever. I, I just don't see it as a problem. But, you know, I'm not anybody's core customer for these things. Well, Joyce has got a question. Do you think that good animal welfare is intrinsic to an ethical food system? No, of course, absolutely. Uh, you know, there's no question about it. Eating less meat would make it much easier to raise uh, food animals under um, better conditions. Now, I mean, if you're someone who doesn't think we should be eating meat at all, you're never you're never going to find a condition that's appropriate for eating animals. Um, but if you uh, are someone who accepts the idea of eating animals, there are ways of doing it that are much, much better, not only for the animals themselves, their caretakers, but also better for the environment. And I think we should be looking at those ways. And that's where the whole concept of regenerative agriculture comes in, is trying to figure out ways in which to raise animals in ways that are better for the environment, better for the animals. And I think better for the people who take care of them. But the um, yeah, I'm totally for better animal welfare. 
And um, you mentioned about regenerative agriculture. Zamina's uh, got a question here about antimicrobial resistance. Uh, she's saying she's wondering about the food politics agenda, considering the, the new future, what she terms the biggest public health threat, antimicrobial resistance. Mm -hmm. um, what, where does this fit on the food politics agenda and what's the role of food systems here? Well, you know, again, I see it from the United States perspective in which the issue has been on the table for decades and absolutely no progress can be made. Um, it, it's one of those things where it just kind of leaves you breathless, where the evidence is so strong. There's so much evidence that the way that using antibiotics as growth promoters is really, really bad idea. Um, we have so much evidence now that um, these antibiotic resistance, ba resistant bacteria carry plasmids that have not only drug resistance, but also have toxic, have toxicity attached to them. Um, animals are grown near or raised near fields of vegetables. The vegetables are getting contaminated. Um, the, all of the increase in salmonella and toxic E. coli on vegetables can be traced to um, contamination by animals. I mean, you would think that this would make it very clear to everybody that these antibiotics have to get out of being used as growth promoters, and yet there's so much money at stake that nothing happens. Um, so this is a failure in advocacy. What is it going to take to do something about it? Um, I used to say that it would take having a death of a child um, of a very important Republican senator uh, from, from a, a food cause to get anything done about food safety in this country um, or anything seriously done about food safety. And I don't wanna wish that on anybody and it hasn't happened. And so this is something that advocates are still fighting about. But if they don't fight, there's no possibility that it'll ever change. Mm. And so you have to just stay in there uh, because it's the right thing to do. Moving on to some um, proposed solutions here. Eduardo's got a question here about um, food reformulation by food industries. I mean, we spoke about uh, vegan ultra-processed foods earlier, but. He says, could you share your thoughts on food reformulation by food industries as being part of the solution? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, a slightly better for you junk food is still a junk food. Or asking it a different way, is a slightly better ultra processed food a good choice? Um, you know, taking a gram or two of um, sugar or salt out, you know, that that seems okay, but it's still ultra processed. That's the power of the ultra processed concept is it's about the processing. It's not about the specific content of one or another nutrient or additive. It's about the whole thing. Um, and so I don't see that a slightly better ultra processed food is going to make any difference to health. Um, so, you know, I'm not opposed to eating ultra processed foods. I love them just like everybody else. I just try to keep the amount small. Well, liam has got a proposal here. Uh, she thanks you for your brilliant uh, talk and says, <laughs> could major food corporations contribute a portion of their profits to underserved communities as part of their public affairs corporate outreach? probably um, as a tax write-off. And I think the proposal from Leanne here isn't another corporate social responsibility um, front thing, but just that they actually have to give some of their money away to underserved communities. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think they would say they are already doing that. At least in the United States, they're funding parks, they're giving donations of products to schools, they're doing all kinds of things. Um, the question is who decides how that money is distributed. I mean, they're certainly not going to do it voluntarily if they don't have control over it um, and are not likely to benefit from it. So, um, you know, the question is, could you get governments to tax food corporations to do that as part of, 
redressing for the health problems they cause, you could that would be very politically difficult in the United States, at least at this time. Um, because most of what I see as corporate social responsibility is environmental. They can reduce the size of the plastic in their containers. They can fund cleanup campaigns. They can do all those kinds of things. Um, they can fund parks. It's physical activity is the problem, not, not what you eat. And they, all of those things are being done. Um, you want something mandated? I don't know how we would do that politically, but I'm for it. I'd like to give it a try. Um, well, Emily's got another proposal here, uh, which is a care income for people and planet. She says she's part of the global women's strike and we, are, we want money, she says, for caring for and feeding our kids and also looking after the planet, making the link with regenerative agriculture. Um, what are your thoughts on a, a care income for people um, caring and feeding kids and looking after the planet? I think it's a terrific idea. Go for it. See what you can do. <laughs> and I think we're over time, Corinna. Are, are we not over time? Um, I think we've still got another uh, five minutes. Is that right, Elaine? Oh, okay. All right. Uh, yeah, still, still another eight minutes, if that's okay with you, Marion. Okay. Sorry, I'm keeping you really on. Let, let, can I ask you a couple more questions? We've got sure. 30, 37 unanswered questions here, so we're, <laughs> I'm trying not to Thank ask you that twice, but mm. I, I wanted to ask one from Laura because she says, what is your top policy ask? I mean, you've given a list. It's a really annoying question to be asked in some ways, but a good one in another. Um, aside from marketing restrictions, what is your top policy ask? What's the number? Well, one? it's it's hard because it depends on which on which one of the big three um, you want to attack. Um, I'm for universal basic, basic income. I think that would make the most enormous difference to the largest number of people. Um, and so that would be policy number one. Um, I think marketing restrictions on ultra processed foods would be another. I'll stop there. If, I mean, I have, I have great big long lists, but the, uh, you know, it depends. And I really want to see agricultural production linked to health and linked to food consumption so that we have a real food system approach to dealing with policy. Um, I don't ever expect to see it in my lifetime. Maybe you'll be lucky and get it in yours. Um, but I, I do think these things are worth working for and toward. And Joanne asks, uh, do you see anarchist theory to be useful at all in food, uh, food systems transformation? Well, I you know I was trained in you have to follow the law. As long as it's within the law, I'm for it. And what about public uh, food procurement? Um, uh, Rosalie says, uh, what about the role of public food procurement? What are your thoughts on, on that as a, as a route to food systems transformation? Oh, I think it's a terrific one. And, you know, we have a mayor in New York City who's uh, vegan and very interested in food issues. He's someone who had type 2 diabetes and has gotten his type 2 diabetes under control by going on a vegan diet. He's a real believer. Um, and he's very interested in food issues and procurement is high on the list. New York City has a million school children. Those children get lunches and the city could insist that those lunches be based on healthier ingredients and is trying to do that. And I'm very eager to see um, how that plays out. But that's certainly very, very high on the mayor's agenda. And I think it's a hugely important tool um, and it's a tool for anybody. For if, if any food company decides they want um, their animals sourced from animals who are treated humanely or more hum humanely, they'll get it. And that'll have an enormous impact on the food system. So the more of that, the better. Well, you mentioned uh, Mayor Eric Adams and Alison says she's a fellow New Yorker. Uh, and saying that he's trying to do stuff to improve food and nutrition in New York City. Um, do you feel that his new policies will make a difference? Uh, she feels that industry influence is being ignored 
Uh, so what is your view about whether his new policies are going to make a difference? Well, we'll see, won't we? He just got elected. He's only been in office for a couple months. Um, let's see what he can do. Um, I was appointed to his food policy committee, but I can't, <clears throat> I can't say that it's done anything. Um, and, I, and I'm not being consulted in case anybody is interested. <laughs> So, but I wish him well. I hope that I, he's got really good ideas. I hope they work. Okay, so I'll end with just with a couple of big questions, which are kind of repeating I've asked before early, earlier on, but just really want to emphasize this because there's obviously a lot of concern among uh, the um, large numbers of people that have joined this webinar today um, around the whole nature of the capitalist system and the economics of, of, of the system. And is, can we do this within the capitalist system is, is the question that Florence asks. And, and Marcus is making the point about the, the cor corporates as a kind of representations of, of capitalism, ca capitalist representatives, as, as he puts it, kind of taking over the global governance of the food system. So the, the, these are you know, big, big questions, big issues seem very difficult to tackle. You've been clear about the role of advocacy, but ha, what, what should advocates be saying about capitalism itself? Well, it depends on whether you can talk about it or not. Um, I mean, one of the things that I think has happened over the last 10 years is that you can start talking about capitalism. When I started out talking about these issues, I never men mentioned the word. I called it the C word. Um, it was not something you could say in public. Now audiences are coming up and asking about it, as you just did. Um, the, so people are understanding that this is the way the system works. And the question is, what can you do? We're obviously not going to overthrow these systems. What can you do within this system to make the food system better for people? And in the United States, we had a period of about 40 years when things were much, much better than they are now. Um, when the difference between the income of rich and poor was much smaller, when there was much less inequality, um, and when things were a lot better. It was the period in which I came of age. So I remember what that was like. And uh, these are political decisions that are made. Political decisions can be changed. Run for office. You want to change the system, run for office. Put yourself in a position where you're a decision maker and can make better decisions. Um, I mean, it seems to me that's what, if, if you're young and you're looking at this and you don't like the system and want to change it, you've got to figure out how to get the power to do that. And one way is by running for office, go for it. Well, I would say that's that's great, Marion. Thank you for asking. I'm just so sorry to the many, many questions that I wasn't able to uh, to ask. I did try and cover all the topics that um, that that were raised, and uh, I will just do a little bit of promotion as well and saying if you want to uh, come and learn about some of these issues that marion has been talking about, do uh, do look in the earlier on in the chat about our master's program in which we cover. Um, a lot of these issues and stand back and try and analyze them um, in, in, in a way and try and really understand them and, and with the idea of you know what 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 can you do about it and your message is clear is Marion is what can we do within the current system and there's a lot that can be done and we need to carry on fighting and, and advocating. Uh, there's been a lot of comments which I haven't read out which have said thanks for being such an inspiration uh, and thanks for a fantastic talk. Uh, so I won't read all of those out now, but there were many of them in, in the chat and in the Q&A as well. So um, with that, I'd just really like to thank you uh, for your inspiring talk and uh, certainly left me thinking um, about the importance of trying to do what you can um, and being bold and moving forward and, and not giving up. It's, it's important. And at the end of the day, that's, that's all we can do. So let's keep going. <laughs> so thanks, Marion. Um, brilliant. And thank you to all the, the participants uh, and attendees for your fantastic questions and engagement today. Thank you.
Okay.